Hi everybody, my name is Randa Abdul Fattah and I'm here to read an extract from my latest book, Coming of Age in the War on Terror. Um, this is a book that I have written based on writing workshops and face to face one to one interviews that I did over about two years with young people who were born around 9 11, 2001, and who have only ever known a world at war on terror. And so the book is my, um, my attempt to understand the world. Um, from their point of view, using their voices and parts of the stories and poems that they wrote in workshops um, to really try and um, understand what it feels like to have grown up only ever knowing a world at war on terror. And I'm going to read um, a few passages from a chapter looking at humour in a chapter entitled The Muslim Performance. Hassan was on a roll. Imagine you yell Allahu Akbar going through security. The class laughed. Mehmet raised his hand and, with indignation, said, You get bomb tested and they act like it's random. Nah, man, they need to bomb test you, the guy sitting behind him joked, and Mehmet and the others laughed. We can't just walk through, said another boy, Ali. I was running a writing workshop with a year 11 class of boys at Inner West Islamic School. Airport security stories seemed to be the running theme. The young Muslim males I interviewed were acutely conscious of their body's capacity to negatively affect others, to have certain stigmas and suspicions stick to them. They were enjoying the chance to be subversive, to play around with stereotypes. During the session, Jalal, 17, said with a grin, I was at another school before I came here. I was called Taliban at school. The rest of the boys laughed. I asked, what was funny? One of the students explained, he's Iraqi which made me chuckle, prompting another boy to call out they should have called him Isis. The boys, including Jalal, all roared with laughter. One thing that struck me about the Muslim boys I was interviewing and working with was that joking and banter were a very obvious and organic part of their classroom dynamics, even when it came to the topic of the war on terror. This is, after all, what characterises most schools bullying, exclusion and conflict occur in what are fundamentally places defined by noise, laughter, teasing, joy, banter and cleats clowning around. In his article exploring the strategic use of humour in stories of racism, Kevin Hylton writes, the use of techniques of humour enables feelings of subordination and humiliation to be transposed into forms of resistance, while its physiological and psychological benefits can lead to interracial relief and catharsis. This was evident among the boys who were clearly aware that ISIS and Taliban stirred up connected histories and stereotypes and had become sticking devices on Muslim bodies. And they enjoyed taking the piss out of this reality. Abdul Rahman explained, we try to at least make jokes about it, at least among ourselves, yeah, because we understand how serious it is we know it's not who we are, especially our religion. The boys switched between poignant accounts of Islamophobia, told without a trace of self-pity, in dispassionate, dispassionate matter-of-fact tones and moments of irreverence and ironic self-awareness. I read Abdurrahman's account to me as young Muslim guys using humour, irony and bravado to reclaim some power in the face of widespread dehumanisation. But also as teenagers, there was a natural youthful exuberance in these boys' personalities, an instinctive rebellion against performing solemnity and sacredness by performing insensitivity as an act of defiance and independence. During class discussion, Jacob, 15, shared his experience about being the only Muslim on his local soccer team. Like the terrorist attack that happened in Burke Street, Melbourne recently, they're like, do you know this guy? Have you seen him at the mosque recently? Jacob was animated. How dumb do you have to be? Another kid called out jokingly, you should have said you knew him. Jacob and some of the others instantly grinned and Jacob said with a grin, the, the thing is, I didn't even know about any Burke Street situation. I told them we're not all related just because we're part of the same religion, but I had no clue what they were talking about. Some Muslim students enjoyed in joking, in, engaged in joking and ironic takedowns of terrorism only among other Muslims. Abdul Rahman, attending an Islamic school, explained to me that when he made jokes with his friends, we're careful about doing that in front of a non-Muslim teacher. If we do that, we make sure it's acknowledged that it's a joke. If we do that, 
I think they, they get we're joking, but it's also for them a concern of maybe they're not joking. I doubted all the boys in Abdurrahman's class were as sensitive to how their jokes would be interpreted. It struck me that those who didn't care were engaging in a powerful act of defiance, a refusal to be measured against so-called radicalization warning signs. These boys would probably have no idea about the existence of countering violent extremism policies that apply to schools, and yet they have internalized the idea that to joke about terrorism as a Muslim is inherently dangerous and risky because of how it can be misinterpreted as something more sinister than just insensitive or callous. One student I interviewed who attended a boys public school in southwestern Sydney brilliantly weaponized humor to alter conditions of fear. Sammy, 16, seemed determined to defy every convention and expectation about how to behave in the context of fears around terrorism. He recounted to me the day his school went into lockdown. Sammy was in year eight at the time and someone had graffitied ISIS are coming on one of the brick walls. Sammy recalled, it was period three. I remember English. The school got a phone call that someone said they were gonna bum up the school. We went into lockdown. We turned off the lights, went under the tables. I started to scream cause I knew it was a joke and I was laughing and then I started pretend praying. And the teacher was like, just sit down, go under the table. And I didn't like this teacher and she didn't like me. We had our history and I gave her help for about two hours in lockdown. After I made it a joke, they all thought it was a joke. I'm an influencer. I asked Sammy why he thought it was a joke. Was it just about teasing the teacher? He snorted. It's Riversby. Who's going to bomb us? If I was in the city and I was at, say, Parliament House or 52 Martin Place and then there was a bomb scare, I would be shit scared. But, like, who the hell is going to bomb our school? Sammy found the entire situation hilarious and deserving of ridicule. He explained, some kids did call their parents. I just said, I'm not going to call my mum. She's not going to care. She's going to laugh. Sammy's mother was equally dismissive of the paranoia around terrorism. She thinks it's politics, Sammy continued. After a while, he said, the teachers were pissed off, mainly because it was bullshit and they missed out on teaching, so they were irritated. It was on the news. I remember them saying in an assembly, don't speak to the media, because the media was outside the school wanting to interview us. And I so badly wanted to talk to them and tell them, oh, we were all so scared and praying to Allah to save us from ISIS here in freaking Riversby. It was such a bad experience. Yeah, they would love it. They'd lap it up. It would be on replay for the entire month but I didn't because they threatened to give me a detention. Sammy paused. It's a serious issue, yes, he said, but it's also laughable in some cases. That's weird, but 9-11's been memefied. I asked Sammy if he worried about how others perceived his irreverent attitude. He told me other students mostly felt the same way. As for the teachers who misunderstood him, he enjoyed it that way. When I asked Brayden, 16, from Grammar College, what he understood about the war on terror, his first and immediate response was, I'll have friends, they'll be in a game and they'll throw the ball and they'll just pretend to throw a bomb saying Allahu Akbar, stuff like that. Just out of context, just randomly. It's a joke now. For Brayden, a non-Muslim, the war on terror was what happened in the school playground. I asked Brayden if these friends who were making these jokes were Muslim, to which he replied, oh no, non-Muslim, obviously. I asked him if this happened in front of Muslim students and he said, there's not too many Muslims in our school, like in our year, so not a lot. I don't think that they really would have noticed. Jokes and racist banter are practices embedded in the dynamic flow of interaction among students in schools, and Bradham seems to implicitly understand that such, such jokes might be offensive to Muslims when he emphasises their jokes made by non-Muslims, obviously. Because the cohort of Muslim students is small, he assumes they wouldn't notice. Brayden said such jokes were random. It's a joke now. The now is telling. As though Allahu Akbar jokes are part of today's zeitgeist, perhaps once unacceptable, but normalised now. During a writing workshop at a library in Blacktown, students from, from a few public and Catholic boys' schools in Greater Western Sydney attended. During the discussions, one boy of Indian Hindu background said with a grim, Sometimes we call the Arab kids 9-11 and they call us back 7-Eleven. The boy's friends, Arab sitting next to him, laughed in agreement. He was humour as convivial sociality, 
what Sarah Winkler Reid found in her study of race and humour in a school in London as interactions which have cross-cutting, counterbalancing or liquefying effects. I like this description. It points to how humour can dissolve tensions, cut through differences or readjust the power difference in relationships. The boys are playfully appropriating stereotypes, but it's reciprocal and lateral, rather than hierarchical, hence the grinning and laughter. I asked the students if non-Muslims, non-Arabs and non-Indians made the same jokes, and a few were swift in their responses. From us, it's okay. From others, it's different. It's not okay. Two of the boys disagreed. It depends, said one. If it's a friend, I know he doesn't mean it. It's just a joke. Could you make a terrorism joke about a non-Muslim? I asked. Most of the boys shook their head. Karim explained, like jokes about bombs is what you expect if you make a joke about a Muslim, but it depends on who says it. Among peers, the jokes, the sarcasm, quickfire banter happens so fast, it feels kind of contrived to sit and analyse the intent and dynamics of these interactions, as if the boys are consciously making statements about race and identity. But what fascinates me is these evolving social conventions in the war on terror, how shared laughter is a product of a certain social, cultural and political context. One student tells us 9-11s become memified. Simulating a bomb sound seems to be the way you make fun of Muslims now. Allahu Akbar is part of the common vernacular, deployed as a joking threat, standing in for menace. For students to use these kinds of scripts in their everyday interactions points to how humdrum the war on terror seems to be in their lives. Thank you.